recording now. Um, so, yeah, so we're welcome to go, everyone, uh, to the session, Aotearoa Conversations, uh, Building a Youth Movement. Um, I'll hand it over to Brad Olson from Infometrics just to give us uh, the context on the session. Thank you, Brad. Awesome. Thanks so much. Kia ora, everyone, um, and good morning. It's, it's exciting to be here uh, in, in almost every hat that I wear as well, to be honest. Um, so I'm a senior economist here at Infometrics uh, and do a fair bit of looking out at how the economy is evolving. But aside from that, I also wear a number of uh, other hats. I'm a youth councillor with the Wellington City Youth Council. And I've done a lot of work in the sort of youth development space uh, and, and uh, as well as a number of initiatives. And what I really like about this all Crikey. Um, we'll stick with that for the minute. It looks like the lights that I'm in are uh, on a timer. What we are seeing, though, um, throughout this COVID crisis is that, you know, young people are very much at the forefront of development. And so I think this is a really nice conversation about how do we ensure uh, that we are getting young people who are involved and more so than just providing a, an idea of, you know, some engagement or some feedback, some consultation, but going further and deciding to have a conversation uh, and, and some action that comes out of it. So I'm, I'm quite excited to see where that session uh, goes. Of course, there is a conversation or part of this um, this video will discuss quite clearly some of the um, the, the, the shifters work and we'll bring in Karina uh, later on to, to detail how that's going in a New Zealand context. And I think that's quite important because here in Aotearoa, this is a, you know, a different environment, a different market. Um, we have some fantastic young people, including some of you on the call. And I think what we want to, or uh, well, what I'm quite keen to discuss is what are we seeing out there from this discussion um, from the Social Enterprise World Forum, but also what does that mean in a New Zealand context? What do we take away from it? What can we uh, draw the essence from and therefore develop for uh, Aotearoa and, and to move us forward? So I don't want to talk for too much long. I think we'll hand back and we'll, we'll crack into the video, um, but keen also that I'm not doing much talking uh, when we get to the end, but very keen to hear your your thoughts, what you uh, what really uh, reflected with you, what, what really hit, but also what you want to do afterwards, because um, if there's one thing that I I'm personally never a fan of, it's having a great talk fest and then running away. I think having some actions, having something to do afterwards, even if it is having a further conversation with something, someone else, finding a new path forward, those are all, all really, really key bits. Um, so I think with that, we'll probably crack into the video. Thanks very much, Brad. So we'll uh, start the video now. Um, I'll just share my screen and we'll, uh, the video lasts for about 50 minutes. So uh, probably about um, around 11 o'clock. Uh, we'll, um, we'll come back as, uh, as a group. So here we go. Enjoy the video and we'll see you back here soon. Jerry, and I think that that international profile uh, is, is a really key one to pick up on because, uh, again, as we think about this in, in a New Zealand context, there are some quite big differences, some shared similarities, but still some differences in terms of um, how we might operate. So I, I think it was useful to get that international context first. Um, I mean, Karina, you, you're doing, you've been working on the pilot um, for show, social shifters here in New Zealand. Um, I mean, what does that look like in, in the Aotearoa context? I thought it'd be useful to get that, and, and I think that'll uh, give us a really good base and, and foundation for the, the discussions over the next half an hour or so. Sure, thanks Brad. Um, yeah, I can give a really quick rundown of the work we've been doing for about possibly the past year or so with the Social Shifters team. So um, yeah, about a year ago, following Ethiopia's Social Enterprise World Forum, um, Elaine actually and I look at, looked at the opportunity to have Social Shifters launch in New Zealand. So at that stage, it was one international platform that anybody could sign up to for free. Um, but based on the research that we'd been doing at that time with our government program, the Impact Initiative, we were looking at, you know, how do we create relevant and accessible tools and resources for social entrepreneurs, specifically in New Zealand. So with that, we did a lot of investigation into all the different types of platforms out there, you know, how would we manage it, how would New Zealand want it to be um, launched and run. And with that, we looked at social shifters and we thought, you know, that's a great platform you can have a, a personalized journey. So that was really important to us. Um, you know, you can uh, put in what sort of work you do, what are the particular challenges that you're facing, and it can give you the exact tools and resources that might help you solve that particular challenge, which is kind of new at the time, but is now becoming a bit of a best practice approach. Um, and yeah, on top of that, we then looked at, well, how do we make this relevant for New Zealand? And that was New Zealanders want to see local content. They want to see stuff 
that their neighbour's doing or that somebody in their town is doing so that they can positively support, you know, their community. So we took the Social Shifters International platform and we actually worked on developing a New Zealand version of it. So the New Zealand version of Social Shifters is um, Arkina and Impact Initiative branded at this stage and we've piloted it for six months so you can log in um, and it's a separate portal to the international one. It does have some international content still on there but there's a lot of um, our Arkina tools and resources and also a lot of events and resources from others in the community as well. So that was kind of the approach that we took there. Um, awesome. Yeah. And I, I think that's really useful as well, particularly around those resources. One of the, the, the key things that, that I picked up throughout the conversation, um, and I think Amy might have said it, um, it, was, it was around sort of, you know, making sure that you understand both what you're good at, but also what you're not good at in terms of where do you need um, support, building good networks and, and, and identifying those sort of skills gaps. Um, and, and I think that's actually, you know, quite a key part of, of all of these sorts of developments is understanding uh, where, where your limitations sort of lie. And, and I say that um, a, a personal story, if you will, um, when I was 17 or so at high school, there was this, um, we were trying to set up a youth health centre. We recognised that young people, you know, uh, were, in a, were in a tough spot. Uh, this is up in Whangarei, and so we wanted to provide that. And, and it was abundantly clear that I'm, I'm not a doctor, and I was never going to be great on the front line, but I had some good governance skills. I could help to raise money. I could help to sort of influence the decision makers. And we had a fantastic group of other people who were doing some of the more admin stuff, uh, who were doing the, the, the stuff on the ground. And so I think that, that identification and what, I, what I'm hearing there is with that Kiwi context, having those uh, resources, having, having the, the, the branded stuff is, is going to be really helpful to allow people to sort of build that foundation. Um, so, oh, that's fantastic. Um, what I think as well, I mean, I'm keen to, oh, I'm seeing Helene. Do you want to pitch in here, Helene, or um, see, see a message coming through? I wasn't sure if that was because you couldn't unmute yourself. Oh, no. No, no, I can. No, I'm just curious, Karina, uh, and of course I was with you at the beginning of the journey, but I am not anymore. And in terms, because we, we're focusing on young people, um, engagement and movement here. Do you actually know the engagement of young people on the social shifters um, platform currently? Do you have visibility on demographics? Um, actually, unfortunately, we don't, but mm. um, because we have been working with quite a few partners as part of this SUF program, uh, as we're you know, sponsoring some bursary tickets and things like that, we have been talking to a lot of young youth focused organizations and a lot of them have been really strongly encouraging their young people to go on social shifters. And we have seen quite a, quite a few registrations. So I'm, I'm getting a sense that it is quite a youth focused thing that you know, young people are jumping on as a strong demographic. Um, I mean, look, uh, Liv, Ryan, um, Bruce, Alice, you, we've, we've got you guys here. I'm quite keen. One of the one of the things that I not only picked up through the conversation, um, but also that I've experienced myself is that when we talk about young people and youth movements, where there's often this discussion around tokenism and, and similar. I mean, how do we move away from that from your perspectives? Both, you know, small stuff in terms of what you guys might be able to do, but what are those wider settings that you think we might want to change? I mean, I'm keen to sort of uh, get a bit of thinking there because that is one of the challenges is that often we pigeonhole young people as only young people uh, and, and we sort of don't allow that advancement to go on. I mean, is there any thoughts from you guys? Keen, keen to get you a bit more involved? It's such a um, good question, and I think sometimes it, it it can get so easily answered by what was talked about on the call, you know, pigeonholing to, so if there's a board, well, then there's a youth board, and tick, we've got our youth representation, but it's like the youth talking to the youth, right, which doesn't really do much for, for wider uh, systemic or organisational change, and I think that's part of the most difficult part of all of this, is that it's not just about putting people in a seat and then being like, great, they're now in the room, it's about making sure that wider ecosystem allows everyone to thrive in that environment, and that can itself self-take a whole bunch of behavior change and us beautiful fickle humans you know we love we love to do things the way that we do things so I would love to see our sort of market shift in, in, in that direction both on the buyer and supplier side particularly when it comes to youth I think that would be so powerful but again that, that requires everyone to come together to sort of be a bit interested introspective themselves and go right am I actually debilitating or enabling this kind of discussion and make sure that you are um, sort of confronting your own behavior and then everyone can um, 
if, if everyone is able to do that, that's going to create that that sort of starting journey for that behaviour change, I think. But um, I'd be really um, curious to see what, what Liv had to say on that, because I know, particularly working in her space, she's had lots of challenges being, you know, the, the young female in the room trying to push a lot of organisational change. Um, yeah, uh, Alice and I are actually quite good friends, hence why she's, <laughs> she knows that. Um, I think also identifying that young people aren't just young people. Um, so I came from a internship program for Māori and Pacifica students, and that's kind of how I got into procurement. And I think it was like a oh, tick box, we've got a PI intern, that looks great for us, but, you know, like it's not just not just young people, like, or not just PI or something like that. You've got to realise that there's multiple facets to a person and trying to look beyond that. And I think part of it as well is bringing in people also, but like you say, not just to sort of tick the box. If that's all you're doing, then... I mean, you. I mean, tokenism really doesn't do that justice. It's something worse. And I, I say that because if we look at this COVID-19 pandemic and look, a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment is trying to examine, uh, you know, where New Zealand moves in the future and some of those big changes. And one of the biggest ones during the likes of lockdown is that we all had to learn how to do this, how, how to use Zoom and similar. And the number of stories I've heard from young people, and I'm talking, you know, almost under, exclusively under the age of 30, who said to their bosses, look, just give me a chance. Let me try this Zoom stuff and we'll, we'll give it a crack. Um, and, you know, I look at our firm, within the first week, we had 400 clients on a call. Um, you know, we've never had that sort of engagement with people before. And so I, I, I use that story to try and demonstrate that instead of having young people in, you know, moving into those positions just because they're young people, it's more because they have that different perspective. I'm not saying that it's a better perspective. It's just not the same as what you've currently, you know, possibly got around the board table or in a new startup or anything. Um, and so, I, I, yeah, I think shifting that conversation away from they are a young person and that's all they I've got it's sort of like they are young and I mean that, that, that's just something to describe them but they bring all these other things the world experience but also a bit of curiosity and not being locked into those old way of thinking uh, old ways of thinking I think those are, are quite key um, bits there what I was a little bit uh, I found it um, cathartic but also hard to hear um, during that conversation was um, Amy saying that you know you have to be quite thick-skinned with this and sort of just continue to break down the walls and um, I look I don't disagree I feel like it's it's a tough place often to get things moving um, but at the same time you know that those you, you've got to be sort of tenacious to, to get things uh, rolling along I mean how do we move away from that. I don't know if we ever get rid of it because, I mean, that there is sort of, I guess, some development in there, but I don't think it needs to be quite as tough as we have it at the moment. I mean, any ideas from you guys? What is that sort of change that we need to see in terms of having people that don't feel like they're having to batter down every damn door to get through into an area that they think is important to deal with? I don't really have the answer to that, but I also found it kind of interesting because I think young people often get told like, oh, you're very precious or you're, you're a bit soft or like we can't take it like previous generations had. So it was quite, I just thought that point was quite interesting that she was kind of having to have thick skin, but then probably has grown up in a world where she's been told, you know, it's not as hard as it used to be. Millennials can be a bit soft about things as well. Yeah, and I, I think it's one of those things as well. I mean, I, I there's a great joke I heard some sometimes, not necessarily around being soft, but also around, you know, not taking a joke. And someone said, you yeah, know, I want to have a laugh. I just don't want to laugh about people's skin colour sort of thing. And, you know, I think I think there's a legitimate conversation there around... Um, it's not that we're, we're, you know, that young people are seen to be precious. It's just that the, the, the values that young people have, have have changed and, you know, things things are moving, um, which is which is quite important. Um, one of the... the, the one of the things I picked up quite early on was that both these guys, uh, the, the, uh, both um, Amy and, and Mary Bell, discussed sort of how they'd got into things. And of course, there was a passion and a cause behind them. Um, but I, I wonder a lot of the time if we have thousands of young people out there and a lot of people who are sort of thinking about movements and they're just not sure quite how to get it going. They know that they want to do something, but it's, it's quite hard to get it moving. And, um, you know, because uh, Karina, I, I know that that's, that's uh, social shifter stuff is going to 
to be helping because there are resources to help direct that energy. Um, and I know, like, I mean, Amy discussed the um, uh, the, the youth, uh, the, the YES scheme. I mean, what other sort of, I guess, foundational stuff do we need to help build uh, a, a movement? Because I think once you've got the right young people in a position, it's a snowball. They'll continue to push it forward because they know how important it is. But I wonder sometimes if it's hard to get that foundation stuff moving, um, you know, basically how do you get over that little barrier to start with so that you've gone from having an idea to doing something about it? I mean, Alice, you had some, some great, great views to start with. Any, anything that you might want to expand on there? Because I think what you were discussing there around, you know, um, when we had young people that were in a more tokenistic view, part of moving past that tokenistic view is also, I guess, giving young people the credibility to move forward by themselves. Yeah, absolutely, Brad. I think the, the role of the incubator is really important here when you are able to get around communities that um, firstly have got experience in your in your area and they can relate to you. Like it's it's very easy to get mentorship from people who, um, you know, are like in your kind of career field or perhaps, you know, more, more senior than you, but actually people that are, you know, running the same journey or have fruit on the tree in that exact same sector. I think that is really powerful, particularly in your social enterprise um, space where everyone's journey is slightly different but at the end of the day they were all founded because of impact and I want to you know change and, the, and connecting with other people that have that in mind is a real like heart to heart kind of connection and it's really really powerful um, so the, yeah that kind of incubator environment you know which the the likes of Akina and, and, and social traders and, and all, all these other groups that um, that come together to help enable that I think that's really important and where the youth come in is, is purely the, their ability to get in that, that arena without the sort of usual cost barriers or age barriers or, or, or th things like that I think that's really important but hard to figure out a solution to such a difficult problem because I think depending on where you are in the world and depending on what particular sector you're trying to thrive in there's probably a sort of um, even in the in social enterprise space is like a, a more powerful more supportive more endorsed social enterprise and there's probably some that people think oh you know don't don't try that that's that's even too hard even in this arena so I think I think that's also another complexity to, to add in there. Totally and I think I mean that, that's going to be true in New Zealand as well you know and and broadly more urban areas for versus possibly more provincial um, rural areas a at the same time I mean, I mean technology is fantastic and that is spreading it out and, and again that's why something like um, the, the the youth enterprise scheme and that are, are so important because they sort of instill some of that thinking early and that is across the country you know it's not just something that happens at the premier high schools in Auckland Wellington and Christchurch so you know those I think early steps are quite quite important um, as well of course as uh, the work that, that the likes of Akina and everyone else does to actually I guess push those things a little bit further making the resources available because it is about setting that foundation um, I, I think a lot of the time and and as well as that it's also I, I suspect there's probably a lot of people out there especially a lot of young people who um, consider this for the first time possibly a bit later in life than we might consider I mean Look, I, I was a nerd at school. I did all of that sort of, you know, um, uh, I was part of clubs and, and, and did got involved with a lot of stuff. But I know a lot of young people uh, who, who weren't, you know, they, they, they did their social stuff, they did their sport, but a lot of them have also gone to either university or into the trades or similar. And, and you do see a lot of them sort of more in their early 20s who are thinking, gosh, there, there is an issue I'm seeing now. And actually now I want to be part of it. And I I think, um, you know, that's a really key area as well to try and get more people uh, involved with. And that was a little bit different, I suspect, than what we heard um, from, from at least Amy. One of the things that concerned me a little bit is how hard it must have been to try and get an organisation off the ground without a bank account. Um, you know, just those, those simple things, which are, are, are big barriers. And again, if you put too many barriers in front of a particular young person, uh, you know, eventually you will stop them from trying because it's just too damn hard. Um, so, you know, I, I think there are those those bigger um, changes and, and challenges there um, that we have to sort of uh, be aware of. Uh, one of the points I did want to pick up was was mentorship and, and that, just that broader sort of conversation around bringing other people in. Um, no one, you know, not on this call, not not across the, the country or the world has all the answers themselves. I mean, f from your guys' point of view, what what do we need to see in, in that mentorship space? And, and also, because I, I love trying to sort of crowdsource information, what what ways of trying to find mentors or, or the right mentorship have, have you guys um, found that have worked? Because, look, personally, I've, I've really struggled with mentors because I'm not quite sure how to go about it. But I know that some people have quite a variety of ways 
they've gone about it. So keen to sort of pick up if there's anything coming through there, uh, the, the, any good news stories, any, any sort of horror stories of how to avoid it. Um, but yeah, how, how does that mentorship develop in New Zealand, do you think? Um, well, for example, when I, I ran my social enterprise when I was, it started when I was 21, so I was quite young um, at that time. And the way that we found mentors was through the, the incubation and we, we managed to eventually get ourselves into an accelerator program, which meant that we had a huge network that we could immediately tap into. But before that, it was a lot of um, people, you know, turning us down and saying we were crazy and um, all that sort of stuff. So I think, yeah, getting into a respected, well, respected in, in some sense, um, accelerator or, or actual program lends credibility to you and, and opens up the doors to a major mentor network. Karine, can I can I just ask on that? I mean, and look, sorry for being obtuse, but I, I've never gone through incubators or anything. What, what's the process there? Do you have an idea beforehand? Because I, I think that's one of the things that talking to people across the country, I think people almost feel like they need to have everything solved before they go and, and, and seek help or find a second view. And I wonder sometimes just how, I mean, is, is it the sort of thing you can go in and be like, look, I want to do something in the mental health space. I don't know what the hell it is yet. But I mean, at what level do you think we need to be getting people involved? How, how um, well thought out, if you will, does the idea need to be from your point of view? Um, from my experience, it, de it depends a little bit. So incubators, I think there's a bit of a wider scope for, you know, you're really passionate about a, about a particular area and you're kind of trying to nut out what that market is and what the business model might be. And accelerators, you maybe are a little bit more advanced. Um, so you're already working on something and it's on in progress, but you need a really condensed piece of time to really get that going and really accelerate it. Um, yeah. Cool. No, and that makes sense. You don't want to accelerate, uh, you know, you, you, you might be going somewhere fast, but if you don't know where you're going, it, it could end up, you know, middle of the desert. Um, so no, totally appreciate that. Um, and I think that, that that's an important probably difference because uh, again, from an outsider looking in, um, it's, it's always been a tough one to try and decipher. So that very short summary um, has given me more information than, than you, you'll ever realise there. Yeah, Brad, um, just to add to, um, Corinna's absolutely right, and she's got first-hand experience of it. Um, it really does, it really, to answer your question, it, um, it, there's lots of things available for different stages of that, um, the, the conception. It could be Startup Weekends, for example, whereas a lot of, I've been a mentor at a lot of these, and a lot of young people, um, which is fabulous, attend these. And it's, you may not even come with an idea, you might come with a formings of an idea. And it's, um, it's that very much that learn by doing. Uh, being, but in having a really concentrated framework um, supported by uh, people uh, within a set time frame. Is it a weekend, which is 48 hours, um, or um, similar, or is it accelerator, which would be three to five months? An incubator tends to be more you know, sort of 12 months plus. Um, so uh, I think the, um, what I've observed um, being um, part of social enterprises in the, in the technology sector is it's more about how do we get young people to know about these? There's actually a lot of this resources and infrastructure around. It's how do we actually get them to know about this and then uh, to participate in them. I think that's the, that's the link that really um, we just need to keep doing. Mm. And I guess, I mean, that, that sort of circles back to that conversation I, I, try, I started a bit earlier around, you know, we've, we've obviously got yes in schools and similar. I mean, we're, we're, from all of your guys' point of view, where are the gaps there in terms of, look, we've got these great resources and I, I absolutely agree with you. And we've got some damn bright people across Aotearoa who, you know, um, they want to make a change. But where is that, um, I'm not going to call it a disconnect, but where, where do you think there needs to be a bit more ma matching of um, sort of that, that, that energy and, and the resources? Um, you know, is, is it a certain area? Is it certain sorts of industries? Is it certain age groups or life stages? I mean, what, what, what's your feeling from the experience that, that, and this is for everyone, you know, the experience that you all have in, in your lives, where, where could we be doing a bit more work to, to link things up. I mean, I would love, for, I mean, I'm speaking from personal experience. I've come from a, um, a refugee background. I would love to be able to have um, more uh, people from refugee backgrounds access a lot of those resources. Um, that's a, that would be a great start. Um, I know that um, I think we've got someone here from the Asia New Zealand Foundation on as well. I think that's an area that would be fabulous as well. Um, I mean, Internet NZ has done a lot on the digital divide and it's actually very real. It's backed up by a lot of research and data um, that just simply people not having access to the digital tools that actually um, 
uh, we actually uh, really take for granted um, is another area too. So, um, you know, it's a lot of the stuff is the societal side of things, but a lot of it is the infrastructure um, things as well. So that's just a little bit of the perspective of um, what I've seen, Brett. I'll pass totally it on no, to everyone else. It. Ryan, I'm not sure if you're there and, 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 and keen to, oh, um, oh, you're just listening. No, that's all right. I, I was going to say, I won't pitch to you. I also do some work with the uh, Asian New Zealand Foundation as one of their leadership network members. So um, definitely uh, agree that that's a group, you know, as well, an area that, that there's um, some great focus on. Because I think what we also heard, and, and again, that goes back to the very first thing I said at the start of this conversation, uh, that when we're talking ab about young people and ab about all of this work to build a movement, We've got to recognise, not only as, as the panellists said, that there's no one size fits all, but um, Aotearoa, you know, we do have to have a specific focus there, but we can't ignore that we are part of this globally connected world. And so we've got to recognise those uh, different elements of, of, of culture, but also, look, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to be unashamed of saying that when there are good ideas elsewhere, we need to steal them and, and reappropriate them for the New Zealand context. And and you've, you've seen that, I mean, the the, uh, the insights from uh, Mary Bell from, from Nigeria, uh, you know, some of the conversations, um, I mean, Amy coming from Ireland, a, a more similar sort of area to New Zealand, perhaps in, in some regards, um, but also some of the work we've seen coming out uh, of, of Asia, and, and I know that the Asian New Zealand Foundation are quite keen not only to um, make sure they are existing and they're moving forward, but also telling their stories, because one of the challenges, I think, again, coming back to, well, sometimes we don't match up people, and we don't have that, that full visibility, is that people aren't, just aren't sure what work is going on and, and haven't heard some of those great success stories. So in New Zealand, it's hard with tall poppy syndrome, but sometimes we not only need to do that good mahi, but we actually need to sort of talk about it a bit more, not to brag, but to actually show people that this is achievable and you can make some real change there. And there's a fine line, I think Kiwis walk really well between talking about the good stuff they're doing and not going so overboard that you think they're just sort of tooting their own horn. They're probably a little bit too too little of that sometimes. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's a key area in, in, in terms of that developing the, the story that we tell um, coming through. And I mean, Helene, you've done some great work in, in the last few years around this this uh, uh, activity broadly. What What is that? I mean, what do we need to be thinking about? What's the next frontier for these youth movements from your point of view? Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll sort of keen to wrap up with a few other um, pieces from other, other people. Yeah, uh, thanks, Brad. Listen, like... Um... I agree with everything that was um, said and in my head, like the way I kind of make sense of all of these um, different, uh, you know, aspects of what is needed for these foundations to exist is, is um, what I think of as, you know, social infrastructure and knowledge infrastructure, you know, on the knowledge side of things, we have been talking about um, um, tools and tools being accessible and relevant. We've been talking about incubators and accelerators and all of that. On the social infrastructure side of things, we've been talking about obviously being connected, having the role models, having access to the mentors, um, having these um, these networks, you know, um, um, but also um, that was the last thing in my head that you just mentioned, you know, the stories and the common language is something that we found is really important to um, building and growing movements. And it's a very tricky one in terms of the language because we don't want to have, um, you know, a blanket language either and different um, terms and different um, you know, suit different people and you want people to be able to be personal and um, relate um, to their place, um, you know, in the world or in Aotearoa. So common language is not always, is not always possible, but I think there's a, um, there's a need for some sort of, um, you know, um, yeah, uh, you know, something that needs to be core to, um, uh, to that sector, even if it, it will always be slightly fragmented uh, with different arms to it. Um, and the stories, um, as you said, and the stories have to have two aspects to them, you know, they need to be um, emotional and inspiring. And we've done that quite well for years now, but they also need to have the data and the facts that we are, to be honest, only just starting to be on that journey to talking about impact in a way that is um, tangible and with real facts and, and data. And that is an important element to building the credibility um, of, um, of the entrepreneurs, of the, of the people doing the work on the ground and giving that growing movement visibility, I think. Um, so, yeah, all of these elements, I think we need to work on all of them in order to give you know, people the foundations that they need to self-organize because then people self-organize. They don't need to be, you know, we don't need to hold their hand. We just need 
these things in place. Yeah, absolutely. Giving them that foundation to let them springboard themselves is is, is the most powerful way to, to go about that. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, all right, I think we've come basically to the end of the session. Um, unless anyone's got any last final thoughts, I did just want to say, um, Bruce, the notes you put in there were fantastic. I think a really good way actually to make sure that we're covering all the bases too. And and I, I dare suspect, you know, I'm, I'm going to copy those and I hope a few others do too, because it's, it, looking at these conversations is always bits that, that we might latch on to more because they're easier to see or because we, we find them to, to be a greater issue that we, we struggle with. But actually understanding all of those parts that we, or all of the interconnected levers uh, are critical because if you don't pull them all at the same time or you don't have regard for them, then you could well be you know rushing off at a million miles an hour with a rope tied behind your back. So I, I, I just wanted to say thanks because I think those are some really key uh, parts to the message that we do need to keep in the back of our mind um, as we continue to move for, uh, forward. So, so thanks um, so much for that. Any, any final bits and pieces that people were dying to yell out before we, uh, we cut things off? Don't all talk at once. Doesn't look like it. That's all right. Thanks so much, guys. Look, I've had an incredible uh, session. Really useful, I think, to hear, again, those international perspectives and then understand what that actually means from uh, an Aotearoa perspective, uh, thinking about also what are the, some of the challenges we're going to face, uh, what some of the, the changes we also need to make and where some of those issues lie. Uh, but more importantly, also how we continue to foster those those connections and those discussions, uh, trying to get um, some some more work going in terms of matching up the the people with uh, the talent and the, and the foundations and the people with the ideas and passion are more important uh, than ever. Um, thanks um, to all of you and and really um, keen and and I hope that you continue all of the wonderful mahi that you guys are doing uh, across the country. Cheers. Thanks very much, everyone.